this. Uh, no, you can you can command as, as, as much as you want. So this um, next unit is, in terms of the number of slides, it's probably the smallest one, just 45, which can be deceptive. I don't want to say that it's the hardest one, but it's um, it contains a lot of concepts that are, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm tethered, so I don't know if, yeah, I can reach. It was, it was like this since I don't know when. Oh, raising, raising the air. Um, so this, this, this chapter in which we're going to cover the molecular biology of the microbes, pretty much we're going to talk about bacterial molecular biology, not eukaryotes. And metabolism of, of the microbes. This chapter contains a lot of what I call fairly abstract concepts, the ones that you can't really touch, okay? Um, a lot of things about protein function, DNA function, how the molecules interact, chemical reactions that occur in the cell. So stay focused and, and ask me questions if something is unclear, okay? So before we actually get to the uh, biological processes such as DNA replication or transcription, we need to talk about the structure of the DNA. I believe that you had a lot of exposure to this, so that you are almost tired of listening about DNA structure. But I think it's good to bring you all up to the same speed. Um, so we get the key things covered before we move on to the actual uh, cellular processes. So DNA stands for desoxyribonucleic acid, and it's a biological polymer, cellular polymer, which consists of the building blocks called deoxyribonucleotides. The exemplary nucleotide, deoxyribonucleotide, shown here, okay, so every nucleotide consists of the nitrogenous base, deoxyribose, or sugar residue, and phosphate residue. Sugar and the nitrogenous base form a compound that we call generally nucleoside. Okay. There are four different nitrogenous bases that can be found in the DNA molecule. Two of them belong to the class of pyrimidine molecules, cytosine and thymine. Pyrimidine is just the name of the compound that contains this uh, six, this hexagonal structure. Okay. Another two adenine and guanine belong to purines and purine is the compound that contains this structure. Okay, so we have two major classes, purines and pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine, purines, cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. Right? Now the sugar is called deoxyribose. Deoxy because there is no oxygen here in the two prime position. If you will compare deoxyribose to ribose, ribose is going to have this here, the hydroxyl group. We will have a chance to compare them, okay? Now, the nucleotide, okay, is formed when nucleoside, ribose, deoxyribose, sugar, and nitrogenous base binds, covalently binds, establishes chemical bond with a phosphate. Okay, then we have uh, nucleotide. And two parts of nucleotide, phosphate and deoxy, 
ribose are common for all nucleotides. Does that make sense? So if you take any nucleotide, any building block of the DNA, and compare it to any other, phosphate residue and deoxyribose residue are going to be the same. Nitrogenous basis is what makes them different. Now that this common elements, phosphate and deoxyribose, form what we call a sugar phosphate backbone of a DNA molecule. It's pretty much an official term, a backbone. Okay? So they form like a basic structure, right? Um, something that to an extent determines how the DNA molecule is shaped. One important thing that I want you to understand here is the directionality of the DNA molecule. Look at this. Every phosphate connects three prime and five prime carbons of two adjacent sugar molecules. Three prime and five prime. And if you will go farther down the chain or up the chain, that's what you're going to see. Three prime and five prime carbons uh, are connected by the phosphate residue. Now, to make, I mean, it took me a while when I was, when I was in college to realize that the word prime, the little apostrophe next to the number, okay, see the little apostrophe next to the number, it has absolutely no fundamental meaning. The reason for having numbers with, a, with apostrophe is because numbers without are used for carbons in a nitrogenous base. So numbers with, numbers with are used for the carbons in a sugar. Okay? Is that clear? So 3 prime and 5 prime always are connected this way. Right? Now, today I learned the new thing for me. Okay, I learned about conga line. I don't know if you know that. Uh, when people, you know, hold each other hips, huh? And dance. dance, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you ever participated in one, and I must admit that I did, I didn't know that it's called a conga line. And I'm not sure if I was entirely sober at the time, but anyway. Um, when people, huh? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not really big vodka fan. I like beer more. Anyway, yeah, that's that's stereotype, which I'm used to. Um, so when people form conga line, they stand in a certain way, right? So like, I am facing somebody's back. The person behind me faces my back. People don't stand like butt to butt. Right? It's, it's very inconvenient to dance in this position. Somebody has to go backwards. Right? So we have a certain direction. We have a directionality. Okay? Same goes for DNA. We have a directionality. We, nucleotides are not connected 3 prime to 3 prime or 5 prime to 5 prime. Bless you. Always 3 prime and 5 prime are the carbons of two adjacent nucleotides, two adjacent deoxyribose uh, residues that are connected by phosphate. Now, what implication does it have? It has an implication of reading the enzymes, cellular enzymes, can read DNA. They can read it from 5 prime to 3 prime, sure. Uh, Technically, nothing prohibits them from reading DNA from 3 to 5. It turns out that all reading happens from 5 prime to 3 prime. All enzymes, which enzymes would you think can read a DNA molecule, can get the information out of it? RNA is not an enzyme, it's a product of enzymatic reaction. And you're on the right track. So, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking for the names. Enzymes that do what? 
Okay, well, transcribe, copy. Copy DNA in one or another form, okay? Enzymes that make a new molecule of DNA based on the old one. Does that make sense? Enzymes that make a molecule of RNA based on a DNA molecule. They need to read and they need a direction. Like we read in English from left to right. Anybody knows why? I personally have no freaking clue. Or Arabic, Arabic right to uh, right to left. I don't know about Japanese, huh? Yeah, so Hebrew from right to left. Yes. But why? Why they read what? They have like different eyesight? No. I assume I assume that it was sort of a kind of common agreement. Yeah, we can do this way. Well, look, I know a lot of Arabs and Jews, other than reading in opposite direction, they're perfectly normal people. Okay? So I mean it's somewhat it's somewhat of an agreement, okay, that people people made. I'm not saying that all enzymes in the cell got together and decided to read it from left to right, from five, five prime to three prime, okay? But it's just so so it happened. Okay, so it evolved. So if I picture the gene for you like this and I say this is the gene scientists got to the agreement that when you picture the gene when you put DNA sequence down five prime is on the left three prime is on the right there's no fundamental concept behind you behind this so just you know so you know Does that make sense okay so got the idea of directionality Right? The DNA is directional. Now, it's a double helix. Watson, Crick, and Morris Wilkins published the paper in 1953, in April of 1953, in um, Nature. It's one and a half page paper. Like one or two pictures. Really, really small. It's in my uh, my personal opinion, it's the biggest scientific achievement of humanity, at least in the second half of 20th century. It's absolutely huge. It's very hard to overestimate. Uh, so it's double double stranded spiral structure. For every turn of the spiral, there's about ten nucleotides. So you have here one turn okay and you can see the blue stuff here this and this that's the sugar phosphate backbone okay so it's on the outside and that backbone when the spiral is formed it forms two grooves the major groove and the minor groove these grooves are not just um, random structural features actually the proteins that bind DNA they bind into those grooves. Make sense? So that's where they get into. That's where that's where they are stuck. Okay. Um, the the strands. This and this. They are anti-parallel. Okay, like lanes on a highway. Like two conga lines going towards each other. Okay? They are anti parallel. So if this strand, assuming, goes from 5 prime to 3 prime, then another one will go from 5 prime to 3 prime in this direction. Does that make sense? Does it? Good. That's, that's, that's really an important concept. Because if you look at the complementarity, and we'll get to that, okay? Actually, you can you can see that, okay? So five prime, three five, okay? Three five. If you look here, five is going to be on this side, okay? Five is going to be on this side. Five is going to be on this side. So these trends go in opposite directions, okay? And actually, this double 
stranded structure can exist because nucleotides, sorry, nitrogenous bases, interact with each other. You see the interaction in the picture? The dashed lines? What do they represent, dashed lines? What kind of bonds are they? Hydrogen bonds. So, which pair of the nucleotides, AT or GC, is stronger? Yes, why? Three bonds, excellent, three bonds. AT has only two. Now, if you have a fragment, okay, before we get to the fragment, can you break down hydrogen bonds? Sure, how? Heat, okay, you can heat it up and bonds will pretty much disappear. If you break down these hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds between nitrogenous bases in DNA strands, what's going to happen to the DNA molecule? Say again? Well, how in half? Can you show, like using your hands? Yes. Perfect segue. So, if you have two strands that being held together by the hydrogen bonds between the bases, if you break down the bonds, the DNA is going to get separated into two single strands, okay? They're going to go like this, okay? This is called denaturation. If you stop heating it up, strands will stick back together. This is called renaturation. So it's, it's going back and forth. Does that make sense? Now, why do you need to denature DNA molecule? Hmm? Can you be more detailed and elaborate on identify fragments? Which part of nucleotide is actually different between different nucleotides? All nucleotides have two parts that are the same. The base is different, right? Does that make sense? Now, so it means that if base is different, this is what kind of a meaningful part. Now, look at the structure of double strand right here. Where are bases? Inside. They're hidden. You can't read them. They're hidden. So, and bases, the, the, only, the only purpose of these bases is to carry the information. And, you know, without reader, information is useless. So readers, like the enzymes that, say, replicate DNA, they need access to the bases. So DNA has to be denatured first. So these enzymes would get access to the bases. Make sense? Like enzymes that allow us to run a polymerase chain reaction. Okay. Does that make sense? Again, when you remove the heat, they're going to stick back together. This is called annealing. Okay? They're going to annealing. Anneal. Okay? You're going to anneal together and form double strand again. Does that make sense? So they can go separate together, separate together. Right? And when they are together, these guys, they're like steps on the stairwell. Things can get in between them, actually. You can stick right here. We'll talk about it. But other than that, they, they, they're pretty useless. Now, interesting thing about <clears throat> the DNA denaturation, the term, so this process, let me erase this. The term for the process of denaturation, it's sort of a scientific jargon, 
but it is so common that we can almost count it as an official term. It's melting. So we say DNA melts. You have to understand. It's not that you have a solid like chocolate block of DNA that you put in the skillet and it turns into the liquid. No. No. You never have such a huge amount of DNA. Okay. It means that Actually, why melting? Now look, DNA can absorb UV light. A lot of DNA detection methods are based on that. Like when, when in, you know, like CSI or something like that, people walk with the black light and look at stuff, and stuff starts to fluoresce. It's mostly DNA that fluoresces, like where the blood is or other biological compounds. That makes sense. So DNA can absorb the UV light. The more DNA you have, the more absorption you have. It turns out that when the part of DNA that actually absorbs the UV light are the bases. So when you expose them, the absorption, when, when you separate the strands, the absorption of the solution, same solution, will increase. Concentration will not change, but since those bases will get more exposed, absorption will change. Now, this is how it would look like. So imagine we have a device called spectrophotometer that allows us to measure that absorption. Does that make sense so far? So we have a we have a little little UV lamp here, okay. We have a sample of DNA, and we have some sort of detector here. So UV light goes through the sample, and some of it is getting absorbed, right? So we can measure how much light actually how much UV light made it through, okay. This machine is called spectrophotometer. Now, if you take your sample of DNA solution, and this is the absorption, this is time, okay? So, you know, the absorption stays normal. Then you start to warm it up. And when you reach certain temperature, the critical temperature, when hydrogen bonds start to break, what you're going to notice is the immediate rise of the absorption because those nitrogenous bases get exposed. Does that make sense? So you see that. Then when all molecules are separated, when all DNA double-stranded molecules become single-stranded molecules, you're going to see a plateau. It will stay at the plateau no matter how hot you turn it in. Okay? And then when you cool it down, when it reaches a certain temperature again, it goes down. So this graph is uh, very characteristic for things like melting and, and freezing and stuff. That's why the jargon word is melting of the DNA. It has nothing to do with the changed physical state. Does that make sense? Okay. Now a few words about RNA. Just a couple of minutes. Um, so RNA, and you can you can guess if we can like boil DNA, right? Then it means <coughs> DNA is pretty stable. Okay, forget about RNA. I'll tell you how stable DNA is. I'm full of that shit of those short stories. Several years ago, British scientists. I don't know if you've heard about that internet meme, but anyway, scientists in Britain were able to completely sequence and recover the DNA of the microbe called Yersinia pestis, the one that caused plague in London and generally in England. I think it was like 14th century or something. Yeah, so how did they do that? Anyone knows? Well, they obviously were digging out. They were grave diggers, right? 
well, body would be a little bit of a stretch here. Imagine if somebody was buried 600 and a change years ago, there's not much left of the flesh. Your senior doesn't really survive in the soil well. Um, now, you're getting there. Your senior pestis is a microbe that mostly exists in circulation or lungs. So lungs are gone, blood is gone, okay? Bones too exposed to the soil, okay? There is one place in the body. Something gets in there and sticks in there. Oh, no, no, hair, teeth, teeth. So what they did, tooth with its animal, sorry, enamel. I, I always have problem with pronunciation of that word. Enamel and dentin. It provides a safe heaven for DNA inside of it, inside of the pulp cavity. Okay. Even bones are almost gone. So it turns out that when people were infected, the circulating bacteria ended up in a pulp cavity, stuck to the to the dentin, okay, all connective tissue from the pulp cavity was gone, blood vessels, nerves, everything was gone, but traces of bacterial DNA were still in the teeth, okay, and they managed to recover their DNA 600 years, that's considerable amount of time, they managed to recover their DNA, sequence it, and actually confirm that it's a specific strain and they can technically make it, but I don't see a point in making new plague. We have a ton of it in California, Nevada. Okay, you can get it any day. You didn't know? Uh, there are several cases of plague every year in the United States. People get it from... Uh, so dogs, mostly dogs go, like people outdoors with their pets. Pets go, like, run around chase some groundhogs, fleas jump from groundhogs to pets, from pets to pet owners, pet owners get the plague. It's, it's very easily treated if it's diagnosed properly. If it's not, they're dead. But, so DNA is extremely stable. That's, I want to give you that. Okay, DNA is really, really stable. By the way, that means that you leave your DNA traces all over.